The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Leslie McGee with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Responding to Delays, Tips and Tricks for OEJAPS Grantees. I will introduce our speaker shortly. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify all attendees via email when it has been posted online. You must use your computer to connect to audio today. If you are having audio problems, we suggest that you close the webinar and log in again. Please note, participants are muted for today's webinar. To respond to questions during the webinar, please use the questions box so that all participants can see your answer. Our presenters today are Elizabeth Petrui and Aisha Gurley Perry from the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services. I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth now and she and Aisha will introduce themselves. Thanks so much, Leslie. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is Elizabeth Petrui. Um, as Leslie stated, I am an Aging Services Program Specialist in the Office of Elder Justice and Adult Protective Services at the Administration for Community Living. Um, some of you all are familiar with me already because I am your project officer, but for those of you I haven't met before, just wanted to say good afternoon or good morning, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you today, and I'll pass it over to Aisha. Hi, welcome. I am Aisha Gurley Perry, one of the project officers here within the Office of Elder Justice and Adult, Adult Protective Services. I won't reiterate all that Elizabeth said, but welcome. Um, and for those of you who know me, thank you for joining this webinar. Elizabeth, I'll pass it back to you. All right, thanks Aisha. And Leslie, if you wanna take us to the next slide, that'd be great. All right, so our objectives for today, um, just first of all, this isn't really an objective, but to uh, set expectations, nothing that we're gonna talk about today should be new information. And what I mean by that is this is a, a reiteration of what you should be hearing from your project officer in your monthly or bi-monthly check-ins. It's what's available on the ACL website in the grantee uh, managing a grant section. Um, but we wanted to discuss some common causes of delays in your work plan that you may encounter as you're going through your grant um, and some uncommon causes, as well as to identify steps that you should take to respond to those delays and to talk through some potential scenarios of what you might be seeing. Um, so we are going to move to the next slide and Aisha will talk about some of those common causes. Hi guys. So some of the common causes as you guys can see on our PowerPoint slide are consist of hiring. And so I know as a result of COVID-19, we didn't expect this to be um, a damper into us moving forward with our grants. But if you are having some issues with hiring, such as your staff part for your staff officers or your staffing, um, APS state programs have many waiting periods that they have to go through as it relates to hiring officials as well as onboarding, as well as delays and activities that have been assigned to that individual. And if you are experiencing something along those lines, what I would say is that um, in this circumstance, the delays can be uh, moved into the next project period or until the new hiring official has been finalized. And if that's a situation that you guys are experiencing, please um, work with your project officer to accept that from a caring. Another form of um, delay is change in leadership. Change in leadership has affected many of our grants. And if you're experiencing some change in your leadership, such as the original person who was assigned to the project has either resigned or moved on to a new uh, agency, please speak with your project officer to ensure that you guys are on the same page to have someone uh, replace or have the new hiring official replace to prevent any delays in you guys moving forward with your activities. I believe acquisitions and contracts have been a big bummer for many of our grantees. Many grantees um, have identified either vendors, negotiated costs, or are waiting approval for signatures for se of senior staff, which can also cause delays in this instance. After the contract has been finalized, those unachieved tasks can be moved into the next project period. And if the grantee is in the final project period, please speak with your project officer to discuss options for requesting or applying for a no cost extension. Uh, this no-cost extension permits the grantee to complete the unfinished tasks in the, in, the, in the extended year 
or ask for a carryover request, which allows the activity to be moved to the next project period along with the funding that's attached to that task. We've also experienced some absences in relationships with internal and external departments. This can also cause a delay. If this is the reason for activities being delayed, speak with your project officer as well. He or she may be aware, and if they aren't aware, they may potentially assist you with establishing new partnerships or rekindling those partnerships that were identified in your original application submission. And one of the main bummers, I believe, for you guys as it relates to common causes are technology confusion which has also been a part of Grant Solutions. I know it has been a challenge for many of our new grantees. Grant Solutions is created as a single system where funding applicants and federal staff <clears throat> are able to uh, review the awards as well as uh, upload documentation, as well as review the physical requirements. And don't forget to upload your um, semi-annual report as well as your federal funding reports. Um, if you're having difficulty uploading these documents into Grant Solutions or accessing Grant Solutions, reach out to your project officer. He or she will be able to assist you with gaining access or even providing a tutorial to get you to walk you through the process of uploading documents or navigating through Grant Solutions. Elizabeth, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Aisha. I just wanted to add on a little bit to what Aisha said to mention. Um, so these are common causes for delays for all of our grantees. And this webinar is specifically being hosted for our Elder Justice State Grants, which are adult protective services at the state level, and our LEAP grantees, the Legal Assistance Enhancement Program grantees. So this is not unique to APS. This are, these are delays that are common across basically anyone who's applying for federal funding. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're really being clear that this is, um, this is not unique to anybody. And I think that in my conversations with grantees, I've had people say like, you know, it, it feels like this has just gone on for so long. Like I was just talking to someone earlier this week where we're almost at the end of year one, and they're still waiting on final signatures from their contracting department in order to execute this contract. And their partner is willing and raring to go. Like they're just waiting for the ink on that, on that piece of paper. And I said, you know, I am so sorry that you're going through this, but I'm honestly not surprised because this is so common in all of the grants that I've overseen. All right, Leslie, if we want to flip over to the next page. Um, so what Aisha just went through, absolutely, I think I've seen all of the, I've seen all of those issues in one grant, but I've, I've every grant I've had has encountered some kind of one of those delays. But there are also a couple of uncommon causes that, um, one of which we've all run into this year, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but another unusual sort of cause that I've seen for delays is legislative approval needed to accept federal grant funds. There are a couple of states that have in their, um, either in their constitution or in their uh, just their processes where they actually have to wait once they're awarded before they can begin any activities or accept the money for a committee within the legislature to vote to approve that. Um, so that's caused some delays for grantees in the past. Now that's sort of something of like, okay, you let your project officer know, and then um, you kind of are at the mercy of the legislature at that point until they get you on the calendar, get everything approved, and then you can move forward. Um, that's just an example of where we need to be in like communication so that our expectations as project officers are reasonable. Um, now with this coronavirus pandemic, this has really been an evolving situation, and we don't know. Um, when it will be resolved and it's impacting our grants in a lot of different ways. It may be that you're, um, everyone is working remotely and it's harder to get a hold of people or people are in different time zones and so their work hours are kind of staggered. People have child, child um, care responsibilities, they're trying to do homeschool, they have other caregiving responsibilities and they're trying to do their job I have, I personally have been having internet outages, which um, the company shall not be named, but I'm not thrilled with them. Um, so there's kind of a, a whole host of problems that have come out through this pandemic that weren't expected. Um, another one that is really problematic is for our grantees that were intending to do in-person 
um, interviewing, case consultation, um, doing referrals to in-person services, wanting to do uh, surveying, all of those things that they had intended to do in person with older adults, um, they're now thinking, well, how can I pivot this to either do it remotely over the phone? Um, can I mail my survey out? Is that going to affect my return rate, which will then, do I need to expand the time that I need to collect my data? How does that impact our final results? So there, this has been a really unusual situation and we're all, um, it's impacting all of our grants differently. So we just wanted to be clear, we absolutely acknowledge that this is an unusual situation and we want to work with you to make sure that your projects can be as successful as possible. All right, so let's um, move over to the next slide and I'll pass it back to Aisha. Thank you, you. There you I go. So some strategies for response to and de dealing with these uncommon um, responses that or delays that we didn't expect. Some strategies are make sure that you stay in con uh, consistent communication with your project officer to revisit your work plan to address any changes within your grant or within your funding opportunity your funding as it relates to those activities assigned to that work plan. Revise your budget if there are any monetary adjustments that are required as well as explore options, as I stated earlier, uh, regarding a carryover or a no cost extension. These options can be explored with your project officer to prevent any delays or carry those activities to the next project period or to an extended year if your grant is approaching the end of its grant cycle. Elizabeth, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Aisha. So these kind of general strategies are gonna look different for every grant. Um, it may be that your activities that you plan to do in year three are something that you could carry out now without completing the year two activities. Kind of every project is different and sometimes they're not um, necessarily consecutive in how the activities are laid out. So that would be a situation where if you had like an in-person if you wanted to do a series of focus groups with older adults, but you're like, that's really not safe right now. We're not sure how we can um, have those focus groups happen in a way that is responsible for our clients, that is for to our staff. We don't have the PPE, et cetera. Um, but you had another activity that you were planning to do later on that doesn't require that in-person kind of logistics right now. That would be a good example of, okay, well, let's see what we can move around to make this work. However, in some cases, your tasks are consecutive, they build upon each other, and you can't move forward to those year three activities without completing those in-person focus groups. And that's when you need to look at, well, can we um, pivot those to being remote somehow? There's challenges inherent in that too. Um, if your clients or the people you wanna have in that focus group are familiar with uh, Zoom or all of the various platforms that we work with, are you going to be able to support them to be able to do that successfully? Um, so there's a lot of different considerations to think about. Um, let's move over to the next slide. Okay. Um, obviously, the best time to think about what you would do in case something goes wrong is before it goes wrong. Um, so before a crisis happens, one thing that we really want to um, repeat that we think is so important is to identify your key stakeholders ahead of time and to build those relationships with people within your organization who can help you move quickly if you need to make some of these changes. For example, if you're looking at your work plan and you realize, well, a big part of our project was hosting an in-person conference and you can no longer host that conference in the same way that you envisioned, um, you're not going to be able to book that venue, the um, technology that was going to support that is not needed right now, maybe you're planning to move that to year three in this case. That requires moving things around in your budget, you're going to reallocate those funds between categories and you may need to submit a budget revision. You'd really need to know who in your fiscal office can help support you making those changes so that you can fill out the paperwork needed to get that amendment done, sent in through grant solutions. It's easier if you know who that person is ahead of time rather than you kind of frantically trying to track that person down um, 
knowing that you have sort of a time crunch and then having to also, you know, make that introduction to that person with the, at the same time that you're saying, and I really need you to do me a favor. Um, the same thing with acquisitions. It is can be so frustrating to be just waiting on um, a nameless, faceless person to respond to you when you just really need to get your contracts executed. But if you can identify who in the office can help you with that, it really makes sense to do that before you need something from them than after. Um, and when I say who needs to sign off when you need to make a change, something that I have encountered with several of my grantees is that when they, when the person who filled out the application wrote down who the contact people were going to be, um, there's two people that have to be identified for key personnel. There's a person to contact um, in regards to this grant who's usually classified as the project director, principal investigator. Um, and they're going to be coded as the person who is our kind of day-to-day -day contact once you're awarded. And then there's a person who signs off who has the authority to make this application, and that's the AOR or authorized organization representative. Sometimes it's the same person. It could be the, the project director and the AOR. You're just going to identify your, you know, the head of your executive director or whoever in leadership, um, you're gonna identify them for both on the grant and then you'll kind of figure out who the point person is for the grant later. But I've also had situations where the person who filled out the application put the AOR as like say the secretary of health and human services for the state. And then when later on down the road, when you have to apply for these amendments to make these changes, it can be kind of hard to get a hold of the secretary of your organization to sign off on a document to go into grant solutions. And they may not have, they may not remember what this grant is. They may be very busy and hard to get a hold of. So it's a good idea to know who is the person who's been identified as the one who has to sign off to make these changes. And if it's not, if the person who's been identified is really not the correct person, you can work with your project officer to get them changed out in the system to someone who still has the authority within your organization to make those changes, but is maybe more accessible. All right, and I will hand it back to Aisha on the next slide. Thank you, Elizabeth. So we're going to go over a few scenarios with you guys. I will read them as well as you can guys can read on the screen. So I'll begin scenario number one. A grantee has been talking to the area agency on AG. A key stakeholder and a AAA leadership has suggested greater emphasis to be on prevention of elder financial abuse rather than data collection. Based on the new state reports just issued, as a result of these conversations, the grantee has decided to amend their work plan to focus on prevention of elder abuse. And we'll we'll leave that slide up for just a couple more seconds for anyone who's reading it to themselves. Um, maybe just a couple more. And then we'll go ahead and flip over to our question slide. Um, so you can respond in the question box or in the chat box, whichever is easiest for you. Um, but this is your chance for audience participation. So everybody out there who's listening, please respond to us and let us know for that scenario where the grantee has been talking to the AAA leadership and they want them to kind of put different emphasis within the grant than was originally intended. What considerations should the grantee be thinking about and what steps should they take? And we'll, we'll go ahead and leave that up for, um, let's say like 30 seconds. And actually, Leslie, if we can flip back to the scenario. So for this, what considerations should the grantee be thinking about and what steps should take? Please tell us in the, in the question box or in the chat box. Not everybody at once. Just 
All right, so we've got someone who suggested conferring with the project officer to make sure the change is in line with funding and the funding opportunity announcement. That's an excellent point, yes. If the, if the emphasis that the AAA is suggesting um, to put more, more on prevention of elder financial abuse rather than data collection, if that wasn't in the original proposal, um, that's kind of a significant change to the work plan. Um, and you'd wanna make sure to go back to the funding opportunity announcement to make sure it's in scope. You'd also want to make sure, you know, what does greater emphasis on prevention of elder financial abuse mean to the AAA leadership? Is this something that was already kind of part of the grant, but they just want you to spend more time on it? Can you put more time into it um, while still meeting those data collection uh, efforts? All right. Andy, I'm still only seeing that first question. Um, let's see, I'll read some of the other ones if they haven't popped up for you. Whether prevention is in line with the mission of the original grant? Absolutely. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Is it in the spirit of the application that was submitted? And if it, is it in line with the funding opportunity announcement? And then someone else said change in scope or budget revision? Absolutely. Yeah, if you're putting more emphasis on this on these prevention efforts and let's say for the sake of argument that that was already in the grant you're just they think you should spend more time and money on it um, what does that mean for your budget and do you are you going to be pulling money out of the kind of technology data collection category and moving it over to does that mean hiring more staff are you moving it over into personnel um, is it, does it require travel to go around the state to do presentations on prevention of elder financial abuse? If you're moving more than 25% of your year's budget between categories, you need to do a, a budget revision amendment. And that's one of those things that has to be submitted through Grant Solutions and be signed off on by your authorized organizational representative. It looks like those are the only answers we have right now. All right, well, I think you all have really covered it. Aisha, is there anything else you think should be no, considered? No, I think they, they nailed it, Elizabeth. We didn't even need to do this webinar. You all know <laughs> what's up. Okay, let's skip ahead to scenario two. Scenario two, in the application, a grantee proposed to acquire a new data system in order to better collect and report certain data elements. The plan was to acquire the system in the first six months of the grant. But after speaking with the person who will sign off on the proposal, the grantee learns it may take three to four more months. Elizabeth, back to you. All right, thanks Aisha. All right, so in this scenario, they said in the application in their work plan, they were gonna acquire this new data system within the first six months and that sort of planning period of the grant. Um, but now they're finding out it may take three to four more months. So what do y'all think the grantee needs to consider in this scenario? Tell us in the chat box or in the question box, whichever one floats your boat. Looks like we haven't had any answers just yet. Oh, it looks like one person said work plan revision. Yes, absolutely. So if your um, your work plan said you were going to get something done in six months, but now you know for sure it might not happen until the end of the year, we're going to need to look at the work plan and figure out um, how, what does this affect for the rest of the activities that you have planned. If you um, said you were going to acquire your data system in the first six months and then you were planning to collect data that you were going to report back to ACL for a certain period of time, does that mean that you need to push back that data collection period as well? Probably. Um, 
and how does that affect, you know, the period of time you had set aside to analyze that data and to tell us what it means? Um, does it, but it could also be an opportunity if you know that your, that your kind of acquisitions period is going to be delayed for this three to four months, how can you use that time to maybe work on something that you had planned to work on later? Great. Looks like someone else said no cost extension. Yes, it could mean that you need a no cost extension. Um, it sort of depends on when this is happening in the grant life cycle. But, you know, if it's in the first six months of a three year grant, um, potentially you can sort of make up that time. But ultimately, you're absolutely right. It could push everything back that three to four months, in which case you can definitely talk to your project officer about requesting a no cost extension. Um, these are things that are, this is absolutely a reason to extend if you circumstances beyond your control required you to kind of push things back. So yeah, that would be another um, amendment to the grant that requires that sign off from your AOR and is submitted through Grant Solutions. Looks like someone else also said consider either carryover or no cost extension to complete the scope, also an updated work plan. Yes, so absolutely carryover is a very good point here. Um, Cause let's say your, let's say it takes more than four months. Let's say you plan to acquire this data system in year one, but you can't sign the contract until year two. So the funds that were allocated in year one for the contract actually won't be uh, spent until year two. So now you've got this chunk of money that you plan to spend in year one that you haven't spent. You're absolutely right. You're going to need to do a carryover to move that from year one to year two. And then finally, someone said, talk to the PO. Woman after my own heart. Yes, you absolutely <laughs> should talk to your project officer about all of these things. That is the recurring theme of this webinar. We really want you to be um, in communication with us so that we can help you and walk you through all of the paperwork requirements. Great, and that's all the responses we have right now. All right, let's let's uh, let's move it over to the next scenario. Scenario three, after speaking with project stakeholders, the grantee decides that funding should be reallocated to spend more on enhancing an employee training and retention program and less on a planned statewide conference. This change means more than 25% of funds for the year will be moved between categories. All right, thanks, Aisha. Mm -hmm. So, tell us and and andy i figured out how to pop the questions out so i think i can read them now okay good um, let me know if you need help thank you so much so tell us in the chat or in the questions box um what does this mean for you as the grantee that now that you are um you're going to reallocate funding between employee training and retention and spend less on a planned statewide conference Budget amendment should be done. Absolutely, Margie, you are exactly right. Um, so the, the key number here is 25%. If you meet that 25% threshold where you're moving funds between categories, you actually need to do a formal budget revision. If it's less than 25%, you still wanna loop your project officer in on, on this whole discussion. Um, so that they can be of help to you, but we don't have to do the formal amendment through grant solutions. Yes, absolutely. Request a budget, budget amendment after you speak to your project officer. You nailed it. All right, let's, uh, let's hit the next one. Scenario four. The project director under the grant has been reassigned, leaving the grant coordinator suddenly in charge. At around the same time, the APS director, who was serving as the authorized organizational representative, takes on a new role at another agency. Additionally, a contractor working on the grant lets the grantee know they have staffing change. So what does this mean for your grant? The project director has been reassigned and another staff person is now in charge. 
your, we've said APS director, but for the sake of including our um, legal assistance folks, just say the, the director um, has been, re has taken on a new role somewhere else and your contractor has had a staffing change. So what do you need to do? Okay, and let's see. I do see a question here from Margie. Quick question, if it's still in the same category, say 20%, are we okay? So if you're you're moving money, if it's in the same category, um, I'm a little bit confused by that, but let's say you're, um, you're spending like less than you thought you would be spending in that category, so you move some money around to a different one, um, then it's less than 25%, you don't have to do the formal budget revision. Um, let's, oh yeah, I've had to do all the tasks in the scenario. Um, yes, you are exactly right. You have to do a change in key personnel, but for which, which of these trigger a key in, change in key personnel? This is sort of a trick question and someone told me it was too complicated. So I'm hoping y'all will um, prove that person wrong and me correct, but it's entirely possible that I will be wrong and it is too complicated. I've been wrong before, so it would not be the first time. All right, I'm not seeing any more responses. No one wants to take uh, your trick question, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> it's, I, all right, I give, I was wrong, it's too complicated. Oh, Mariah, yes, it, both the PIPD and the AOR require a, an official change in key personnel. Yes, you are exactly right. Um, the change in the contractor staffing does not require a change in key personnel form. That is something that you can definitely let your project officer know about. It may mean that there's gonna be some delays on that side, and so it's definitely something we would wanna know, but it does not require that change in key personnel form. You only have to fill that out for the project director and the authorized organizational representative. So that's the, the main point of contact for the grant and the person who has the authority to make like legal changes to your grant or cooperative agreement. Yes, I too love a trick question. Thank you, I feel validated. All right, we're gonna move on to our last scenario. Scenario five. In their application, a grantee proposed to conduct in-person interviews with several older adults after they engaged with APS. In light of COVID-19 pandemic, the grantee realized their plan to conduct in-person interviews needs to change. This is a significant portion of the work allocated for the project year, and the data is required for analysis for later deliverables. So we may have, uh, we preempted this a little bit in our discussion earlier, but what would y'all do if this was your project? So you had planned to conduct in-person interviews. Um, that's a huge portion of your, your activities for this project year, and you need those interview responses. You need to collect that data to analyze for the project deliverables that you're turning into ACL at a later date. What do you need to think about? You can tell us in the question box or in the chat box. Y'all might be panicking, just thinking about if this was your grant. All right, not seeing anything yet. Everybody's taking their time to ponder. Okay, we've got one. Revised work plan and consider changing format for interviews. 
Exactly. So those are two different um, approaches that you could take. So just like we mentioned earlier, um, is there activity that you had planned to do later on that is not dependent on conducting these interviews? And could you do that now and delay them until there is a time to conduct the interview safely in person? Um, or can you change the format for the interviews? Is there another way for you to collect this information and data so that you can still um, deliver those um, materials that you told us in the application you would? So that's, could you conduct your interviews over the phone? Could you um, put them in a written survey format and mail them out? Um, it might be that switching to one of those formats um, changes the responses that you get. And that's also something that you would want to document in your final report to ACL to explain, you know, in our application, we intended to do these in-person interviews. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to switch to printing out written, written surveys, mailing them, and that meant that we only had a response rate of, let's say, 35%. That might mean if you're thinking, oh, wow, I'm, we're not really getting enough of these surveys back, we're not getting enough data, that you need to extend the period that you're doing it in order to make sure that you do have enough data to analyze. Um, someone said, update the work plan and talk to your project officer. Yes, tell your project officer what's going on. We know what your projects are, but we don't know them into the detail that you do, so it is, your responsibility to prompt us on the challenges that you're facing so that we can help you brainstorm. Um, and we may have some ideas to help you to pivot to a different format or to revise your work plan. It might mean that the activity that you thought you were going to do is just really not feasible in its current format, in which case, you know, and this is sort of a worst case scenario, you may just have to completely revise your project and go back to the funding opportunity announcement and think of something else that would be in scope that you could do instead. All right, and someone suggested do it virtually. Absolutely, if we can do it virtually, we absolutely should. Change of scope, work plan revision, yes, and a budget revision, absolutely. If you had that 25, if you meet that 25% threshold, we'll have to do that budget revision amendment. Um, but yeah, if you have to change your, if you are going to be doing these interviews in person, it might mean that you allocated money for um, your staff to, maybe you're gonna reimburse them for mileage. Probably not, that's not a thing that a lot of people have money for. But let's say you had money put in for mileage to go out to like some rural areas. Well, now you're doing them over the phone. Um, so you don't have mileage, but it might be that you have to, um, help your staff who have poor internet connections or they don't have the technology to do this. So there may be considerations that impact your budget. Absolutely right. Anything you wanna add, Aisha? I believe you covered it all, Elizabeth. All right. We are gonna move on then. Okay. So I know I sound like a broken record, but the most important thing when you encounter these delays is to be in contact with your project officer. Whether it's me, Aisha, Omar, Andrea, we wanna help you, we wanna be in touch with you. Um, if you can't, you can reach us by phone, by email. Um, I will even turn on my webcam. If you want a video chat, you can see what the inside of my apartment looks like. Um, but we want to, be of assistance to you. We want your projects to be successful. And delays are normal, even if the causes are uncommon. Um, it, running into these is absolutely normal and we can address them. So nothing is apocryphal. We can definitely work with you to make sure that you can move forward. All right, and now if we move on to the next slide, are there any other questions at this time? We've got you know, about 20 minutes left of the time that we'd set aside for this webinar. We um, do not have to take the full 20 minutes. Uh, my grantees will know I am always happy to give you back time at the end of our meeting, but Aisha and I are here and we can answer questions if anyone has one.
this is my first time being able to see questions as they come in, so I'm um, I'm kind of fascinated by this. The curtain has been drawn back for you. Oh yeah, I've I've seen the wizard. <laughs> Give it a couple more seconds. All right, not seeing, oh, we got one, okay. Is a no cost extension only appropriate in the final year of a grant? That is a great question. Um, and yes, the answer to that is, Yes, uh, you would only apply for a no cost extension in the final year of your grant. Um, if you were thinking, if you're in year one, let's say, and you can't complete the tasks that you had planned to do in year one, that's when you're looking at a work plan revision, um, some of those other amendments that we talked about. But when you get to your final year and you're looking at your project cohesively and you're thinking, oh, we do not have enough time to complete our remaining objectives, that's when you're going to talk to your project officer about a no cost extension to fulfill those remaining um, approved work plan activities and you can ex request an extension of up to one year at a time. Theoretically you can do a second no cost extension. Um, they are frowned upon but possible. Anything else? Hmm. All right, we got one. Would you please talk more about whether or when a waiver of match requirement may be a better solution than a carryover, or are they mutually exclusive? Aisha, do you want to take that one? Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. So a match requirement has something has a lot to do with whether or not you have uh, the ability to match the in-kind. If you don't have the ability to match the in-kind, what you will need to do is reach out to your project officer and provide a monetary percent that you or your state will be able to match. And at that time, the project officer, as well as our grants specialist, will work together with you to identify uh, whether that match number or that percentage that you provided is permissible, and we will get it approved for you. Um, the match normally has nothing to do with your carryover. Your match only solely has to do with your overall budget and the ability to match the in-kind. All right, great questions. Anything else? Clarity, please. So clarity on the last question. Each grant, when it's awarded, you guys are um, requested to match your grant at 25%. HHS or ACO has a waiver in which they will allow you to reduce the match requirement under uh, below 25%. And that's normally based on a financial hardship or a given right now the experiencing that we're going through is COVID-19. So many states funding has been reduced. With the reduction, um, states aren't able to match the 25% in kind. If that's a result of your budget being reduced or your funding being cut as a result of APS or your LEAP grants, what I would say is reach out to your project officer, um, inform him or her that you guys aren't able to meet the match and the match requirement which you guys are able to meet may be 5%, and if it's approved, then that's the matching which you guys will be able to, uh, that, that's the amount or percentage that you guys will have to uh, meet for your match requirement. Okay, so I think uh, hopefully we've given you some more clarity on the, the waiver for match. Um, we've got a question on what is the difference between a carryover and a no-cost extension? So a carryover is moving money from one year to another um, for the reason that you weren't able to complete the task that that money was assigned to. So you're going to move the money from between budget periods. Um, a no cost extension does not have money attached to it. It is specifically having to do with tasks that are not left, um, that are left undone. So when you get to your last year and you think, okay, um, we still have to complete our 
we haven't finished our data system overhaul um, and so we can't um, we can't complete our tasks until we do that so you would request a no cost extension so no cost no money just adding time on to the project period in order to complete the tasks okay and then so another question do, 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 let's see any budget change under 25 percent requires no formal budget revisions but that should still be reflected or don't worry about it at all so if you're moving if you're re revising your budget and let's say you know you thought you were going to have to spend x amount on um purchasing a training but then fewer people than you think need to complete the training and so it costs less than you thought it would so you've got money left over to move into a different category um, if you're moving more than 25 percent of a year's budget between categories so um, let's say moving between uh, staff and personnel and travel um, you have to submit an amendment through grant solutions and get that formally approved if it's less than 25 percent in a year's budget moving between categories you don't have to do the amendment but you still have to talk to your project officer about it anything you want to add on that aisha no you covered it elizabeth perfect okay good glad we could answer that Oh man, I would, you're doing a webinar on your phone? That is very, that is bold. That is a bold choice. I'm glad you've got your question through. All right, anybody else? All of this grant solutions amendment stuff is um, very, uh, non-intuitive so we absolutely want to make sure that we can help you understand it um, Aisha I'm going to defer to you on this question how is indirect cost calculated so indirect cost is calculated by the percentage in which your grant award amount is so hypothetically so 25% of your grant award your grant may be awarded at hundred thousand dollars so 25% of that be $250,000, I mean, $225,000. So with the $25,000, you have to find a way to either offset that with indirect costs, meaning volunteers, your state may offset it with some funding, or your agency may offset it with some funding. So that's how indirect costs is counted. It's a, a, according to the monetary amount in which the grant is awarded at. that hopefully that answered your question on indirect costs anything else Okay, I am not seeing any more questions come in through the question box or through the chat. Um, so I just want to reiterate that um, if hearing this presentation has sparked a question about your own grant that you get in touch with your project officer, we're happy to walk you through it. Um, and we don't operate we're not lone rangers in this office. We work as a team. So um, when you ask one of us a question, you get the benefit of everyone's experience. All right, well, that concludes our webinar on responding to delays, tips and tricks for OEJPS grantees. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for taking the time to participate and for your thoughtful responses to our scenario questions. Uh, hopefully we have addressed your concerns and if not you know how to get a hold of us so that we can um, thank you again and we look forward to speaking with you at your next check-in call